Joining us now to talk about Brazil's challenges, Dr. João Augusto de Castro Nieves. He is a senior analyst on Latin America at the Eurasia Group, a Washington, D.C.-based firm, and he also worked for the Brazilian Senate. Welcome to the broadcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It was back in 1982, U.S. President uh, Reagan at the time it was at a uh, banquet there in Brazil. I'm sure you've heard the story, and he said, I want to toast the people of Bolivia. Yes. And, and it kind of comes to illustrate, at the time, how the United States viewed Brazil, Bolivia, they're just kind of our backwater, next-door neighbors. But times have really changed. Bring us from 82 to 2013. A president from the United States would never make that kind of mistake now. No, definitely not. I think that back then and until recently, Latin America ended in the Andes for most uh, officials in, in the U.S. Basically, there was not much beyond the, the, the Andes. And now, you know, after, the, after, I think, 10 years, Brazil became a, a very powerhouse, I mean, economic powerhouse, and, and in many sense, in other global issues. So for U.S. government or U.S. president, it, to make that mistake again, it, it's, it's unthinkable. You, you talk about what a powerhouse it is, and there's, there's no disputing that. I mean, it's one of the top economic powers in the world, but how does it transfer that economic power into political clout, do you think? Well, that's, I think that's the big uh, question in Brazil. I think one of the main goals of Brazilian diplomacy for a long time has been to become a more uh, a vocal player in, in global affairs. Uh, Brazil is definitely a regional power, but it is a regional power with global ambitions. And, and, and it, it, is, it, it does have voice and opinions on some global matters, but not all. But that's definitely a challenge that's being discussed today in Brazil. One of the things that's interesting about Brazil is, uh, is it's one of only three countries, Germany and the United States, to host both the World Cup football and the Summer Olympics in two years. And that's a, that's a great thing for the country, and yet uh, I, there's a lot of people, and maybe you can talk to us about this, it seems like there's a lot of people in the country who look at this and say, well, this may be prestige for the country, but it's not necessarily good for us as citizens. Can you frame that for us? Yeah, I mean, the same people who seven years ago, eight years ago, were cheering the fact that Brazil won, was awarded the right to host these two events, they're basically the same people that were in the streets recently protesting against, not directly against the events, but against the fact that the government needs to prioritize uh, uh, spending. And uh, many, while many people are seeing a lot of money put in, being put to stadi for stadiums, they're not looking, they're not seeing the infrastructure surrounding the stadiums, which basically metro systems and et cetera, being improved. So I think that uh, it is definitely a challenge of a country that's coming to terms with the fact that it's much more powerful, but there are many, many, uh, 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 many, many issues to be dealt with in terms of development in Brazil. Talk to me a little bit more about that. You say seven years ago, these are the people that were championing yeah. it, because this really is kind of an interesting dynamic in that it's not just the poor, it's some of the middle class very disenchanted about this as well, correct? Yeah, I think Brazil's rise is not the end of a pro process, it's the beginning of a process, actually. The fact that now the country has more, not only more international visibility, but also has to do more and more with, with domestic challenges to reduce inequality, uh, tackle poor infrastructure. So I think now it's the, the, the real debate in Brazil has begun. Where should we spend this money? There's, of course, the economy has grown. There's more money going around, but there are, there are also many challenges. So I think that it's just the beginning of a process of a country that has reached a new level. You talk about that disenchantment, but you also worked for the Brazilian Senate, and it seems to me that the people are also very unhappy about corruption in the country, and how is that being addressed, and, and is it aggressive enough? Well, corruption is definitely a problem in Brazil and other democracies, I think, and some, a big problem that hinders a, a more development, where you see a lot of money being shifted away from important projects to, to basically uh, f because of corruption. I think that today, even though you may see more headlines on it in Brazil uh, than, say, 10, 15 years ago, the situation has improved. There's more accountability. There's more transparency today in Brazil than there, there was 10, 15, 20 years ago. But, of course, it's that ongoing challenge. It will never be over. Uh, and I think that part of the protest had to do also with corruption. Uh, but I think that the government and some other uh, 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 independent uh, agencies in Brazil are doing their best to, to try to tackle it, but it's definitely uh, uh, two steps forward and one step back when it comes to evolution in, 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 in battling corruption. Did the protest surprise you at all as a man who goes to that area back and forth, or did you sort of see it coming as well? No, of course, it, with, with social media today, it's hard to, to, to predict these kind of movements because the cost of mobilization is very low, very, uh, very low. But the broader story here for Brazil is the story of the rise of the middle class over the last 10, 20 years, which a middle class that has more 
a political or a more uh, sophisticated political demands. They demand more from their from the political class. So uh, they are disgruntled with the quality of public services. So there is, while the economic situation is overall is not that unfavorable, there is some uh, latent, latent uh, uh, discontent with public services. But it's difficult to pinpoint what the trigger for the protests were. I mean, some may say that were the, 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 was the uh, warm-up to the World Cup that people actually saw the stadiums, they literally saw the cost of hosting these, these, these international events. So, you know, I was surprised, of course, w as many were with the protest itself, but the broad story of a rise of the middle class and how it's much more challenging for governments, for leaders to deliver to that middle class, that's a story that we've been monitoring for, for, for quite a while. You talk about the demands of the people, and yet there's the demands of the country as well, and, and it wants uh, permanent status at the UN Security Council. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how important that is to Brazil and its credibility? Well, that's been one of the main goals of Brazilian foreign policy for, for quite a long time, uh, to kind of uh, get that permanent seat in the Security Council as kind of a sign that the country actually uh, uh, rose to the status of, of, a big, of a great power. Uh, I think that there are many questions re that remain to be answered uh, regarding that. W one thing is to get that seat. The other thing is what will Brazil do uh, once it gets that seat in terms of what will Brazil offer, uh, uh, what kind of solutions to the world's problems, and does Brazil have the, m the money and the resources to actually be uh, one of the permanent mem members. President Rousseff uh, canceled her trip coming here to the United States, and I want to talk a little bit about the NSA, but I want to talk more about this and what kind of a signal it sends to the populace, because Hugo Chavez got a lot of mileage about calling President Bush the devil, and there is this kind of belief that standing up to the United States, uh, it does help your stature somewhat, and, and it has helped her domestically, hasn't it? I think a little bit. Of course, it was unfortunate timing. I think there was no easy way out of this of this incident. Uh, uh, so, so the fact that there was nothing major to be announced in this trip, it made it seem more reasonable for her to cancel. And in fact, it, it's important to see that both presidents uh, coordinated a response. They made it to make it seem that the decision to cancel or to postpone, which they're saying, was a joint decision. So I think that. Uh, it, it may bump of, uh, her approval ratings a bit internally, but foreign policy is not a major issue in Brazilian politics. And, uh, and I think that uh, overall, I mean, she was right to, to, to cancel because if you just come to Washington, D.C. to point fingers at one another, it, it's, you know, and presidential diplomacy is a lot about gestures and positive ones. I was just going to ask you that because I, I remember you in an interview saying gestures are more important in many cases than accords. So this gesture, how important is it? Well, the gesture, of course, for her is important because it's other other uh, presidents, other countries were, were targeted by this scandal, by the NSA scandal. And and President President Obama himself, he canceled a state visit to Russia because of Snowden, because of the scandal. So I think that what President Rousseff did was, was re very reasonable, and she 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 made an effort to kind of uh, try to uh, you know distinguish these things and not to contaminate the, the bilateral agenda by this incident. But I think th things will blow over after several months. Thank you so much for your time. Thank Appreciate you. it.